my name is Brian Crum, and I'm going to moderate this uh, panel. It's use teaching contracts, drafting using real contracts. Uh, when I first was introduced to this topic, what does that mean? I mean, we're, they're all real contracts, but I guess the contracts that were used in practice or have been used for some person, you know, commercial purpose. Um, on the panel with me is Shelley Dunk from uh, Loyola University of Chicago. Uh, I won't go into all of her credentials. I'll let you folks do that. Uh, read it in the... Uh, yeah, exactly. And Shin Pocock, right? Good enough. Uh, from Truro College, J.P. Pershing Law Center. And um, I think what we'll do is go in order as it appears in the agenda. So Shelly, can you lead us off? I will. Okay. Um, my name is Shelly Dunk. I teach at Loyola University Chicago School of Law in Chicago. Um, this is my eighth year teaching a contract drafting and negotiation class. I started teaching the class as an adjunct. Uh, in 2007, I joined the school as faculty. I'm the co-director of the Business Law Center Clinic, which is unrelated to the class I teach, but I have been able to do so. Um, some parts of that clinic in our class. The class is a two credit hour class. I try to limit it to 16 students just to protect myself and my time um, for, and for grading reason. And the goal of the class, the stated goal, is to learn the basics of contract drafting and negotiation. It's very, very simple. I want students to learn to create and revise simple, clear, and meaningful documents for their clients. I also want them to learn to start to think like a business lawyer, and I've heard this in other um, sessions here, just the emphasis of this litigation perspective and the transactional law perspective. Originally, when I started teaching the class, there weren't that many um, sources, and I used, I met Tina Stark at a conference eight years ago and started using a draft of what later became her book, that she had just emailed me this working copy, and I used her materials, and then I used a comprehensive real estate, commercial real estate agreement that I had used in practice when I was at Equity Residential. And that was, you know, 33 pages with exhibits, quite comprehensive, updated all the time, so it's as state-of-the-art as a real estate purchase and sale agreement. Um, the class was supplemented then with sort of in-class negotiations and sort of one-off drafting assignments that we, I just made up back then as well. So while I did use a real contract, what I found later second, third year of this, is maybe it wasn't the right contract. Now, I still use the real estate contract as a base agreement because it contains a lot of well-written, whoops, wait a second. Yeah, there's my class, four. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't, it just wasn't um, energy producing. You know, it's, it's comprehensive. There are a lot of words. It's dense. It can be difficult to understand if you're not a real estate person. I mean, there's three pages of title and survey requirements in the agreement. And I don't think the students were really sort of motivated by that. A lot of them didn't have a background in real estate. And this was abstract. And then I realized, hey, you're not teaching a real estate class. You're teaching a contract drafting and negotiation class. So maybe you need to supplement the materials a little bit. Um, that's not to say I don't think the students got something out of that original class. I think there was value. It just really wasn't interesting at the end of the day. So then, um, once I started working in the Business Law Center Clinic, which is a live transactional clinic at Loyola, we have about 140 clients. 65% uh, are not-for-profit, 35% are for-profit. They're either mom and pop or some web-based entrepreneurial folks. Um, gotten some lawyers who aren't practicing who have brilliant ideas in the last two years. So it's a very, pretty interesting mix of clients, and I would start coming into my contract drafting class maybe with a story of the week. Like, hey, we have this kind of client, they wanted us to draft this kind of contract, or they came in with a contract that was had this problem and this problem, and the students all of a sudden could sort of relate and focus you know, on these for-profit clients in a way that I don't think they could really access this comprehensive real estate document. Um, I don't use these materials without getting explicit permission from my clients. I don't <coughs> change the name if it's something we're drafting prospectively for them to use with their clients or vendors, but if it's something they've been handed by a third party, we do redact that information or change it, tweak the facts. Um, 
Benefits were immediate. The small business focused agreements really increased the energy level of plants. People started participating in a more tangible way. I think they were more confident. I felt like they felt like they could relate to the clients a little bit better and the concepts were more accessible. And then we would start asking questions like, okay, let's look at this agreement. What do you think this language means? What do you think they were intending to do? What was the drafter trying to do? What do you think the client thinks that this means? And the students started to really see these agreements as planning documents. A contract is a planning document that you're going to create for your specific client. And it was a definite shift again in that litigation to business, transactional oriented focus. Um, we begin the class, we do teach the basics, you know, the basic building blocks that are outlined in Tina's, in Tina's book. And we, half the class is a lecture format on maybe a specific concept or area of law. The second half though, really after the fourth class, we use a different agreement each week. And one example is we had an aromatherapy <coughs> store owner in Hyde Park, Illinois, who wanted to sell local art. Uh, artists, you know, represent them and sell on consignment in his store. Okay, the contract, you know, the assignment is to draft a contract. First of all, what, what do you even call it? So we go, you know, start at the beginning, draft an art consignment agreement for our client, and we have some in-class discussion about what kind of things do you think your client's going to want to see in that agreement. And again, I've heard other people talk about this. First, we start with the law. Can you do this legally in Illinois? Now, there is a statute on the sale of consignment art in Illinois, and we start there. So they get that real world aspect. Where are we going to start? Can we even do this legally and achieve the client's goal? And then we talk about things. You can bring in all kinds of drafting concepts. How do you draft a commission sentence? You know, how is your client going to get paid for the display of this art if he sells it? And we throw some of those provisions up on the board. What do you think it should look like? Is this effective? Can you enforce it? Um, who's responsible for insurance? What if it's damaged while well in the store? What if, you know, there's all kinds of issues that you can flush out and then send them away with a meaningful drafting assignment. It's going to take them a good chunk of time to figure out and make them think. Oh, also, sometimes when they come back, I have them um, email me their assignments prior to coming back for the next class. And I will take some provisions that are either well-drafted or not well-drafted, and we will compare them anonymously. Um, we have a floor shop and massage. Uh, but there's this unexpected emphasis that they don't even recognize on client counseling, which I think is really important. That's part of my background. I was at a large firm, and then I was in-house, where I really got the benefit of getting to know my clients really well. And that's a great thing to you know, hammer at home, that they want to have meaningful relationships with their clients in order to create these effective documents. Um, I think students really get the concept that client drafting contracts is very client-specific. It's not legal to fill in the blanks. Sometimes it's some of that. But more often than not, the more you know about your client, the better of an advocate, you know, the better document you're going to produce for them, especially if it's a client that doesn't have a lot of money and they come in and they want something they can use with all of their perspective, you know, floral clients, like every single one. You want to pr produce a document that's going to be effective for them. Um, they also begin to realize, like, wow, wait, we have questions. It would be easier for me to do this if I understood more about my client's business. And here you can also throw in some, you know, some general mentoring. You can talk about what it's like to be an associate at a firm where you're not going to be able to get that information. You're likely getting your information third hand from a mid-level associate who got it from the partner who got it from the client. And how do you effectively draft in that situation? And when is it appropriate to ask questions? And we go through all uh, discussions about those things as well. Um, another benefit, I think, of using a variety of smaller focused documents is um, that students, they just really get into this and they start drafting a lot and they become less afraid of just taking a crap. <coughs> it's, a, it's a creative problem solving exercise every single week, something maybe they've experienced, maybe they haven't experienced it. Um, we have to discuss how to effectively communicate comments. Do you want to be the drafter? Talk about all kinds of practical aspects of contract design. Um, another example of the learning aspect of this is we had a client who was a massage therapist who contracted with a local hospital, a large hospital in Chicago, to provide chair massages for nurses who come off duty, you know, after long shifts. Well, she was served an agreement the other side of the hospital, bigger, you know, 
drafted the agreement, gave it to our sole client, and she brought it in. And you know what? It wasn't really a very effective contract. And that was sort of an interesting lesson to the student that just because you're this big national name, maybe it's still not a good contract. And then I had them review the contract and come up with a memo outlining the points they would go back and negotiate. And we talked about negotiating strategies, and they eventually had to revise the contract. So students enjoyed the class. It was incredibly interactive. I felt like the conversations were so unscripted but really productive. Uh, they did a lot of work this semester, and I felt like their work product was uh, very successful. In my handouts, I've included a sample agreement. Um, it's a client of ours that's a florist shop. She actually just is an event floral person. You can't go in and buy flowers, but you can have your wedding done by her. Um, and she came in with an agreement that had been drafted you know, by one of her friends or one of her friends used in their business, and this is what she was using for every single client that she had, and it's not, when you look at it, it's not very professional looking, and it wasn't actually a very effective document. It, there were no signature lines, and there's no date on the agreement, but those are just the starting points. So what I would do is hand out the agreement in class, give a little backstory about each of the clients, have the students take 20, 15, 20 minutes and go over themselves, or in teams, you can you know, it's your choice, and then we would discuss, you can go provision by provision, you can hit the highlights, you can incorporate it into what your topic is, if your topic is defined terms for that week, and you find a really good, bad contract that doesn't set out the defined terms, it's very useful, I think, to use this type of agreement as an overlay um, structure. somewhat different tack than Shelley and, and Sharon have, and I focused on two specific assignments, um, both of which I participated in in practice. Uh, the first exercise is uh, two non-competition agreements um, that my clients had, and they became um, unnecessary after some corporate purchases of the business. And this was in, and I've got permission to use these. Originally I redacted it, but since that time I've, I've been given permission to use these documents. But Masco Corporation, a big uh, building supply company, purchased a Virginia uh, limited liability company, which was doing business in Knoxville, Tennessee. And one of the contracts for Tony Whistle had a choice of law provision of Washington State, and the other uh, individual, Tom Moore, had a choice of law provision uh, of, of Virginia. And what I do is I, I believe that beyond contract drafting, you know, lawyers, business lawyers also interpret contracts for people. So I want them to do a little research, figure out what, what's necessary, and look at the statutory law and the common law from the jurisdictions that apply to the contract. And what I do is ask them to write an opinion letter to the General Counsel of Masco, which is a Michigan corporation, telling them whether um, a chance report in Knoxville, Tennessee would grant an injunction against these individuals if they wish to go to work for a competitor. Well, first of all, uh, out of 12 students, four or five of them will write it based on Tennessee law, which I, I'm really not upset with because when I actually went to the an injunction hearing, the partner that was uh, opposing me actually argued Tennessee law, and I argued Washington law, and as a result, not only did I did not get the injunction, but I got an attorney's fees paid for it. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it's it's uh, it's eye-opening to students. You know, people think that the boilerplate is not important. We overlook it. You know. A, a well-trained attorney doing business in Tennessee all their life automatically assumed choice of law, they're doing business in there, didn't read the contract. They, they tried to argue that it was a mutual mistake. And I said, well, I'm not objecting to it, Your Honor. <laughs> and uh, so he said, well, even though I don't understand you know, 
why Washington stayed in there. You're not objecting, objecting it to it, and they drafted the contract. We'll, we'll let it go. Uh, as, as they do research, and I generally have stretched this over two classes because I think it's valuable for them to kind of get frustrated because there's a lot of different ways you can look at it and then come back and get some feedback and then go let them do some more uh, research. But the Virginia contract, on the other hand, is a little bit trickier in that, okay, it's reasonable that Virginia law should apply since it was a limited liability from, uh, uh, company from Virginia. But what's interesting about that is the assignment provision. Virginia law doesn't allow assignment for personal services contracts. So it's not effective as against that person, even though he's working in Tennessee, if they're, if they're using the client uh, Virginia law. So as a result, you know, it takes a lot of frustration, but the students really get ingrained uh, the importance of boilerplate and understanding the surrounding jurisdictional law. And I, I haven't found another sort of exercise that does, accomplishes that objective quite the way this assignment does. So if you're in the mood or if you think that this sort of uh, assignment is worthwhile for your class, I've, I've given you all the, the, both of the contracts and I will, give, I will send you additional information if you just email me. My email address is on the, the front cover. I'll even give you more fact patterns and maybe even the complaint if you really need it. So. Um, and the second exercise I use basically stems out of a much bigger litigation matter. It was an asset purchase agreement that went bad. Um, uh, the, the owner of the entity that was purchased died two days before the deal went through. And they wanted the son of the owner to continue working with them for a period of three years to make a, uh, an easy transition. Well, within nine months, they felt like they had the deal pretty well going, and they wanted to get rid of the guy. So they came back and said, "Okay, if we'll ex we'll extend our non we'll, ex we'll we'll have you sign a non-competition agreement, and we'll give you extra money to go for another five years of a non-competition agreement." The only problem is the non-competition agreement did not supersede the employment agreement. They, they didn't do what it took to say that this non-competition agreement replaces and supersedes the employment agreement. And my client didn't complain or didn't even notice really, it was, I noticed it. But when they came, when he, when he and his brother started out in a competing business and they sued him for, you know, tortious interference with contractual relations, uh, uh, breach of fiduciary duty, breach of contract, breach of non-competition agreement, and 12 other counts, conspiracy, the whole works. Uh, that was something that, for leverage, we counterclaimed back, that you breached the employment agreement. You didn't pay them uh, within five days after termination without cause, you didn't pay him $67,000. The non-competition agreement is an amendment to the original agreement, and therefore, that's not effective either. Uh, it's one of those things that I think, once again, it's hard to teach students the importance of detail and the importance of making documents articulate together. And once again, once they spend some time on it trying to analyze these issues, uh, I think it gets ingrained into the, into the way they do business. Uh, also, since I've had such a personal contact with these two documents or four documents, I could tell them additional issues, like the person who signed the, both the employment agreement and the non-competition agreement. In depositions, I found out that he didn't have the capacity upon which he was signing those documents. Uh, in that sort of business, they will start a new LLC every time they pub, uh, uh, every time they make an acquisition, and he just didn't happen to be who he said he was in that document. Um, drafting errors, 
on the part of the lawyer, they probably should have done some due diligence, should probably recognize that fact. I also asked the students to say, is there anything else that you can pick out that I did? And one of the students, and a couple since then, have, there's, there's a subordination agreement in, in the, in the non-competition agreement because it was set up through borrowed capital from Merrill Lynch Capital Markets, Markets Group. And it basically says something to the effect that this agreement is not valid if, it, if the company is under default to Merrill Lynch. So is that a conditional contract? Is that a conditional contract that he doesn't need to perform until they've fully performed? And they, they stretched out the payments on the night competition agreement over two year period. Which I thought was a good argument. I, you know, had I realized that I probably would have made that argument as well. It was interesting because this was a federal court case. Uh, and I went back to see if I could get some of the documents <coughs> online. My documents are there, but they must have pulled their documents out because there was probably some trade secrets involved because there was part of the operational bonuses for these individuals were based on their EBITDA cal uh, calculations. And I think they pulled the documents because they felt that there were some trade secrets. Uh, and, and also, they probably didn't want other small mom and pop uh, operators to think that this is uh, the sort of thing they do. That they buy somebody and then try to litigate them out of their out of the sales process. So. But again, uh, I took a little different tax. These are two uh, applications that I use in, in class. If you're, if you're interested in using them, I can give you more information. Or if you find them useless, I still thought they were good. Yeah, so. Okay, thank you. today is using an oral presentation as part of a drafting class. And the way I use oral presentations is another way, different from what Shelley does, different from what Ryan does, my attempt to bring real life contracts into the classroom. Uh, in terms of the oral presentation, what are the advantages of having this as an assignment in contract drafting class? Well, I've tried to enumerate them for you. Uh, usually in my class, we really focus on drafting issues. And I had submitted my syllabus, not really for inclusion in this handout, although I see they did include it. But I think you can see on the second page of the syllabus with the chart, I try to give students assignments that puts them in different roles in any transaction. We do a couple of assignments in which they are a drafting attorney. Our third written assignment puts them in the role of a reviewing attorney. I give them a document and I ask them to comment, write up their comments in a letter <coughs> to the drafting attorney. <coughs> our fourth assignment that uh, places them in the middle of a transaction. I know when I did this sort of work, we would go through perhaps eight or nine drafts of a contract before we were ready to sign. And in part, that was usually due to the client coming up with new terms to the deal as we were papering it. But my fourth assignment then really gives them comments from a client and asks them to produce a red line strikeout version so they at least have some experience with that. But what this all means is that while we're talking about different parts of a contract, how to translate business terms into contract language, how to organize a contract, in my class we really don't focus heavily on law of a specific jurisdiction or law as it pertains to a specific type of contract. So I use the oral presentation as one of two final assignments in the class. And uh, while their final written project is meant to bring together everything that we've studied about writing a contract, the oral presentation gives them a different sort of work experience and it allows small groups of students to teach the rest of the class about specific types of contracts. So, this really allows us in the class to, to get in a greater degree of depth into the types of provisions that certain types of contracts require, specific problems that may arise in that sort of business deal, and so forth. If you are at a school where most of your students will go into practice into that state, you can instruct them to focus on the law of that state. 
If not, you could perhaps allow them to focus on the law of the jurisdiction in which they intend to, to practice. And I think I've included the, um, as the second page of my papers here, directions for choosing the oral presentation assignment. <coughs> uh, usually I will suggest to students a number of types of contracts that they might want to talk about. And I, I will also ask them if they have a particular interest in any type of contract. Uh, I normally, for example, wouldn't include an entertainment contract, but I find that because I teach on, on, in Long Island, uh, I have students who work for the music industry in New York City in our, from our part-time program, and they're very knowledgeable about licensing music rights and so forth, and they like to do a presentation in that area. So again, the list is not fixed. It tries to respond to the interests of students in the class. Technically, the course that I took is called Drafting Commercial Documents, and I really broadened the name of that, the, the course here. Uh, for the oral presentation, I include a presentation on prenups, if that's a student interest, or on a divorce agreement, because many of my students will go into family law, and if that's <coughs> the, the type of contract that really interests them, I don't see any harm in their doing a presentation on that type of um, agreement. I usually tell them again by the third or fourth week of the semester after the drop ad period has ended so we know how many students we have and who is definitely in the class that we're looking for a presentation of anywhere from 15 to 25 minutes and I suggest to them what they want to do <coughs> that they want to identify particular issues that are important perhaps show us typical provisions that would address those issues that they would want to identify for the class the specific interests of each party in that type of contract. I ask them also to compile a bibliography because the idea of these oral presentations, each small group is teaching the class and by the written materials that they prepare, they're giving other students something to go away with. And usually I have many third year students in the class, this is something that might help them as they go into practice just to have these materials to look at. In terms of coming up with the bibliography, I suggest that they look for treatises and other materials in the library that speak to this particular type of contract. Usually I discover that uh, my third year students have never in their time in law school used the library's electronic catalog, so they're not familiar with all those other sources in the library besides the case reporters and the statutory codes. So, this is meant to familiarize them a little bit more with the, the, the library. And I'll sometimes ask, please include a sample contract. Uh, in some instances, students have pulled out off actual agreements from the internet. And uh, so they, they prepare such a presentation. Now, I, I want to talk also a little bit um, about more of the logistics of organizing this assignment. So while I, I will tell them, I will give them the sample you have here as your third page, what this assignment is about. And I usually suggest that they talk among their classmates, find someone who is interested in the same type of contract that they're interested in, and that they form a team. In the past, I've usually done this with teams of two students, which seems to work well. But as you can imagine, that also means I've had a fairly small number of students in the class. I think this fall I faced having up to perhaps 18 students and I may have to go to teams of three to have a manageable number of presentations in class. Once they know what the, the parameters of the assignment, on the next page you'll see I then have a, a handout that I ask them to complete. You, of course, don't want teams doing a presentation on the same type of contract. That's going to get boring. So you have to be sure that all each team is working on a different type of contract. And you're, you're probably not going to do all these presentations on the same day or days. I try to spread them out over the last four or five classes so that we also have some class time to complete whatever other matters we're working on. What this means, then, when students make their selections as to topic and as to date, I ask for usually three choices. And what I try to do here by asking for both topic and date, if I can't give a team their first choice or even their second choice in terms of topic, 
I really do make an effort to give them first choice in terms of when they want to do their presentation. Do they want to do it earlier in the semester? Do they want to do it the last class? What, those are factors that you want to take into consideration. Uh, in terms of what this provides for the presenting students, it's not only doing the research and learning about that particular type of contract, but in terms of the crate skills. And I think for the past almost 20 years, schools have been evaluating courses and what happens in courses in terms of which skills identified by the McCrate report are we teaching. We can see for the oral presentation, they do have to do some legal research on a particular type of contract, perhaps to a particular jurisdiction, that it gives them exercise in oral communication skills. And again, it's not an oral argument. It's not client counseling. It's really a teaching sort of presentation. Because we try to set these assignments up early on in the semester, so students have six to eight to nine weeks to prepare, it means they get uh, experience in organizing <coughs> and managing the project with their partner, so there's some collaborative work. And finally, I usually also do ask them to identify <coughs> issues that might arise in this sort of transaction. So it is a presentation that fulfills some of the goals of the McCrate report. And I guess I can say, um, at my school recently, we've been interviewing to hire a new assistant dean for career services. And I was interested and pleased to learn that many of the candidates that came in told us, you know, law firms nowadays, particularly the mid-size and the small firms, they are depending on their lawyers to bring in new business. And frequently, that involves doing a presentation to a group to tell them what your firm can do. So again, I think this reinforces the idea that an oral presentation uh, is a skill that lawyers should have. And this is an exercise that allows students to get some experience in it. Just to talk a little bit more about the logistics here, I think I've told you about the process for selection of the topic, for the dates. Again, the sorts of contracts you suggest, it really depends on your own student body. If you have students, I think, that largely go to big firms that may be dealing with security matters and finance matters, maybe you want to have them doing reports on some of those types of documents. <coughs> if you really deal with a population that is going to be general practitioners largely, family law, you can suggest um, contracts that come up in those areas. I've had students really be wonderfully inventive here. I know a student who once did a presentation on franchises and typical terms of a franchise agreement brought in for everyone uh, a hot apple pie purchased from a local franchise, brought in samples of napkins to illustrate the, the sorts of uh, terms that have to be covered. Uh, for a group that did a divorce agreement, somehow they managed to pull off from the internet the divorce agreement between Roseanne Barr and one of her husbands. So they were able to bring in their own contracts that interested the other students. Uh, again, I think just keeping in mind here, you have to figure out if you're interested in doing this, how it would fit in your own course. If you do, if you teach a really large course, I'm not sure oral pre presentations would work that well. If you have a limited number of students, I think it works far better. But again, you never quite know until the drop ad period has ended how many students you'll have, how many presentations the, the class will need to listen to at the end of the semester, when that means you need to start them, for what classes. So that's the one variable <coughs> that you have to deal with and finalize as the semester goes on. I guess I, to end, I just have uh, sort of a bit of an anecdote here. And since it's anchored in use of the oral presentation and contract drafting class. I want to tell you about it because particularly if you're at a school where you don't have a developed transactional curriculum and you're hoping to see that go forward, if you want to see more sections of contract <coughs> drafting, I just want to tell you a little bit about this. Uh, I teach at Turo and uh, to tell you a little bit about the aspirations of the faculty here, 
Long before I came there, the idea was that the school would have a, a spiraling curriculum, meaning that in the first year, we would introduce students to various oral skills, for example, counseling, negotiation, and so forth. In the second year, they would take a course that would involve them in simulations. And finally, in the third year, they would be in clinics, where they would be putting to use these skills with real clients. This was the ideal. The school actually made uh, good progress with respect to the first year. They reduced the student-teacher ratio in legal writing and research classes. Uh, they added an extra hour of credit to each semester so that those classes have three hours in the fall, three hours in the spring. And we are able to introduce students to client counseling, to, to interviewing, to negotiation. Uh, in the past few years, the school has been wrestling, if you will, with that second year requirement. What do we do for these simulations? Because again, the ideal here was classes of no more than 10 students, and everybody takes this in the second year, and it really does focus on interviewing, counseling, and negotiation to the extent that you have either audio tapes or videotapes of students engaging in the, the simulations. So they can, can then uh, evaluate themselves how they're doing. Well, <coughs> you're probably realizing that right now, um, everybody, every second year student has to take this and only 10 students in a class, gee, that's very resource heavy. The faculty came to realize that very, very quickly and we had to become a bit more flexible. I guess a, another mm -hmm. ideal requirement was that certain of the McCrate skills, the, the, particularly the oral skills, the client counseling, the negotiation, uh, factual investigation, those were to be the skills focused on. And we realized that a lot of existing courses that students took in their, their second and third year wouldn't count. So we would have to generate all of these new courses, um, cover them in terms of teacher coverage, it just wasn't possible. So at that point, the school relaxed its requirements a bit and said, okay, a, a simulation course like this to meet the requirement, the intermediate skills requirement, it has to, to uh, employ a majority of McCrate skills and maybe we'll have classes of 20 and yes, maybe they'll have to be taught by adjuncts. We made progress in moving forward on that ground as to the third year, again, a resource issue, I'm not sure there's any school that really has the funds to require every third year student to participate in a clinic. We have a lot of clinics, but I don't think we'll ever meet that goal. Well, how does this relate to what I've been talking about in terms of a drafting class, a basic contract drafting class? Well, I just finished my fourth year at Turo. I had come there from another school, and my first year there, I noticed that Contract drafting, drafting commercial documents was usually offered once a year. It was taught by an adjunct. And that first year I noticed that it was oversubscribed. More students wanted to take it than could be fit in. So I immediately spoke up and said, gee, you know, I'd love to teach this as an overlook. I did contract drafting in practice. I've taught a class like this before. If you want to teach, if you want to add another section, I'd be happy to teach it. So my second year there, we had an adjunct teaching one class in the evening program. I taught a class in the day program. We weren't entirely full, but we had enough students to go forward with two sections. The third year, we offered again two sections, but this time, the adjunct's course had to be canceled. We didn't have enough students. What happened this year? Well, I was all set in January to go forward with the class, and in the first week, before we even had our first class meeting, we didn't have really too much registration, and so the administration canceled the class, and that meant for the third year students who wanted to take it, they're just completely out of luck. They graduated a week ago. So <laughs> my problem here was, well, what, do I, what can I do about this? Other than just publicizing the class, which I don't think would be very effective, well, being on the curriculum committee and knowing what the school wanted to do in terms of that intermediate skills requirement, I recognized that because I already had an oral skills component in my oral presentation, if I could just add one other component, a negotiation exercise, <coughs> I could then satisfy the requirements. So this is what I did, in fact. I got the drafting commercial contracts class certified as a class that would satisfy that intermediate skills requirement. 
And I think that's going to do a better job in anchoring it firmly in the curriculum. Uh, at least for the coming fall, we seem to have the required number of students. And in fact, it's been scheduled also for the spring. So I think the, the point here for anyone trying to get more transactional courses in the curriculum, I know as teachers, we all tend to focus on the course and what we want to teach students and what we want to get out of it. We also have to think about the, the purposes of a course in the law school's bigger picture. And certainly the coming dialogue, we've heard this in a couple of <laughs> sessions today, it's going to be about outcomes <coughs> and assessments. Transactional courses, because of the many assignments and so much feedback, I think they offer an excellent way to build into the curriculum what's going to be needed in terms of courses giving various formative assessments to students. So whatever the view of your school is, every school seems to have its own view of what it's seeking to uh, teach students. I think this, this show, simply here, because I already had an oral component through the oral presentation, I was able to tweak the course a little bit more, have it fulfill another requirement, and it became popular with students. So to the extent that you can either meet student goals or perhaps meet the administration goals in having enough courses there that show different forms of extensive formative assessment, I think it may be possible in the future to create and maintain transactional courses if that's something that's still coming to the fore in your school. And I guess that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Uh, Joan? Yes, Joan Hemingway, uh, University of Tennessee. I actually have two, but I'll, I'll ask one and then let other people go, and if there's time, I'll ask another. Um, Brian, my question is actually for you. I'm delighted, um, given that we teach at the same school, I didn't know this, but to hear your emphasis on boilerplate as not boilerplate. In other words, boilerplate not being this type of set that just gets sort of plunked on each agreement. And I was particularly curious about your exercise where you have the non-compete and the employment agreement. I assume one of the things that you deal with in boilerplate in that uh, exercise is the integration clause. And I was wondering if you could just say a, a little bit more about that aspect of things, because I try and teach that clause in another class, and I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, uh, let me look at my notes really quick, because I did have something written down to that effect. Um, both in, in the second exercise, in both the employment agreement and the non-competition agreement, uh, there was an integration clause in both, basically saying that this is the entire agreement. And in the non-competition agreement, there was no reference to the employment agreement saying that it superseded it or that it replaced it or that it was replacing it as effective as a certain day. So I felt my position at that time was pretty strong. And you know, I try to emphasize it to the students that you know, to effectively supersede or amend, you've got to basically look at the business purpose and then go through each provision and say, have I covered every provision that needs to be changed in order to make this uh, an effective amendment to, to the original contract? So, uh, for the fellow behind it. Um, well, Ted, I'm Ted back from Michigan. Uh, I got a question for a couple questions for Sharon, sort of about the, about the oral presentation. Um, I mean, from your description, it sounded like you know some of the students really got into it. I mean, the franchise agreement and the divorce agreement. I mean, I assume that's probably not true of all of them. Uh, and, uh, and, <laughs> and if that's the case, I mean, what 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 was your role during a, during during the presentations? I mean, if one really kind of got off track, or uh, I mean, did you step in and try to guide them a little bit, guide them back to the, you know? Best tangential issues? Or? Well, thank you for your, your question because it reminded me that I really didn't talk about the last part of my outline here. And that was the last time I taught this class. I realized that I did not require students to do a PowerPoint, but they were welcome to do one if they wanted. And this was the first time that I really saw from group to group to group, they had no sense in how to use a PowerPoint. And that's why I included my list of bullet points. I told myself then that the next time I teach this assignment, I would devote at least 15 to 20 minutes in talking about effective use of PowerPoint. Um, I did require, of course, a paper handout for students. 
But again, here the students didn't just, they didn't seem to have a good sense. Sometimes they would want to show the class a specific contract provision, but it would be very long. And we were in a small seminar room. I mean, this was a small class, and nonetheless, not being very far from the board, they had reduced the typescript of the provision so small on the PowerPoint that you couldn't see it. You know, you had to c consult your printout of it. Uh, so they really didn't have a good sense of how to use PowerPoint, basically, and also how to perhaps use the paper copies in co to complement whatever they're using in terms of PowerPoint. Overall, I would say I found that most of my groups really did a pretty good job. I, I never really had to step in. Uh, things were never so off track. Some, of course, did a better job than others. But the one thing I think I would do the next time I, I teach this would really just to point out some basic things about PowerPoint. And again, I think <coughs> each of us knows our own students. You may have a group of students that all you have to say to them is, you know, there are good ways and bad ways to use PowerPoint. Google effective PowerPoint usage and you will get a variety of websites pointing out to you things not to do. That might be all you need to say to one group. For another group, you might have to really talk about it in greater detail, about the font, about good choice of colors, so that even though the size may be fine, but you can't read the lettering against the background that they've chosen. Uh, so simply in, in the technical terms there, that's something I would do the next time around. But in terms of substance, I can't really say that I've ever had problems so far. Um, what I wondered, Susan Duncan from the what University of Louisville. Done? What was your name again? Susan Duncan. Okay, um, How do you know, like you said, you tell them identify particular issues, special different interests of each party, and the particular requirements. And I can see it being a great resource for the, for the students graduating. But I wouldn't know what those are for each one of those things. So how would I know if they were correct when they presented it, or would I be sending out a whole class of students with the wrong information? I mean, how do you monitor that, that you're actually giving them the right information? Well, again, that's something that they should have researched, and when they put it on a PowerPoint or on their paper, they should tell you, from, again, what treatise that they consulted that has identified those points. Again, it, it's part of the research they have to do, and it's a different sort of research than finding cases or finding statutes. So you felt comfortable that they had it right? Yes, and again, you do have some control in listing the contracts that you perhaps like, like them to explain. So you have a little bit of control there, perhaps choosing contracts that you're somewhat familiar with, or at least you've heard another presentation um, in the past. Sometimes I've had um, friends come in, you know, with a special area of expertise, and I suppose you could have one of them sit in on a class presentation, maybe if your IT is not your area, but you have a friend who does transactional IT, they might sit in the audience and ask if you, I mean, that way you could sort of double check if you didn't feel comfortable. Thank you. I'm interested in hearing from each of you name first. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jeff Prosky from Pacific New George. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to know how you guys go about teaching the due diligence element of the transaction. How do, you, how do you teach your students to get smart about a deal, even a simple deal like a, a basic employment agreement, before actually putting pen to paper? Uh, in my class, uh, we talk about due diligence as a separate topic, the whole class first. But then with each individual contract, you will be surprised at what your students know or what they start asking, and then it, it, be, they feed off each other. It's almost like group bank happens and they realize like, oh wait, but I don't understand that. Or I'll prompt them with questions depending on what the subject matter is and how familiar I am with it. But I mean, it's difficult because they don't know what they don't know, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they've never even read an entire contract or they don't really think about it as creating this, they're creating law. They're creating a document that's actually going to be used by someone and hopefully not litigated. Um, but it, it, we spend a lot of time talking about due diligence in the abstract, and then we, I do try to talk about it specifically with each subject matter. I put to, uh, the final project I have, I split the, the class up into two law firms, and they actually go through a deal. And, you know, they do the letter to the they do the negotiation, they uh, initiate a draft, they, they 
email drift back, drafts back and forth, and due diligence is one of the elements. Of what I mean, I've had them go to the register of deeds to look up, you know, property uh, uh, issues, and uh, so they catch on. I mean, it's it's probably not as thorough as one would expect of a professional, but or I mean, a seasoned professional, but uh, they're getting. They're, they're getting an idea of the steps you need to take in order to feel comfortable about the transaction. I guess uh, I would say again, not very, a not very thorough attempt on my part, but I don't know if anyone here attended the conference in Chicago that Tina and Richard Newman organized about five years ago. I think it was 2005. There was a speaker there who talked about how in his initial classes he has students get together and think about how they would draft a snow plowing contract for just some small, a small business person. And I usually like to do something like that at the very first class and just ask students to get together in groups, what issues do you think you have to cover? And you know, common sense can get you so far in, um, you know, when is it you have to plow? How much of a snowfall? Uh, how frequently? But a really important point of that exercise is, as a deal lawyer, you have to know the business. If you don't know the business, you're going to have a lot of trouble adding value to the deal through your participation in it. So this is something I tell them. It's an exercise that I hope, bring hope brings home that point. But again, in, in a very basic contract drafting class, you just don't have the possibility to teach them all about the business of any problems you're using, as well as the law that comes into into effect. To follow up with that a little bit, I also bring in real professionals, like a real developer, uh, and a real you know, I, I make the I make I give them the opportunity to interview people who do this on a day to day basis. I actually bring in a law developer and then his lawyer, uh -huh. and we talk about the disconnect or connect that happens in that relationship, and that can be. Fairly interesting for the students. What are they talking about? Uh, where they are in their deal. <laughs> I've had you know people who are a little bit adversarial or angry with one another over a deal that was going on at that time. <laughs> Coincidentally, when I invited them in, and one was very angry that another one had you know the client had done something the lawyer did not want him to do <coughs> like three days before the class, and that got a little heated. And it was pretty interesting because the client took the you know stance that it was really his business decision. It was not a legal decision and therefore he was in the right and the lawyer was like, but I'm trying to protect you and here's what you don't, you're not looking at. And that was a, that was a fairly interesting class. I've also had a, a lawyer who's a name partner in a smaller firm come in and talk about managing his clients, which is a really big part of his business. And that's a very interesting perspective also, I think, for the students to recognize that how do you control your client? What if they don't tell you the truth? You can't always control your client. <coughs> Um, or you can be a very good client controller without them knowing it. Those, those kinds of issues come up. So we try to talk about that. Do you, do you discuss the role of in-house counsel? I do. That's part of my background. Um, and I was an active, I mean, there are different roles in in-house counsel depending on where you are and what, what your shop looks like. It could be a mini law firm, it could be just you. I mean, there's been everything in between. I worked in a very active, we did a lot of our own work because my employer didn't like to pay outside counsel. <laughs> And didn't like to pay us actually. Um, <laughs> we got a pretty good deal. Um, we were, you know, fairly active, and it was. Uh, it can be quite rewarding. It can be frustrating. Your clients are as far away as you are from me right now, and they're always there. You know, I wanted to often put something like a little leash thing in front of them, <laughs> some kind of electric fence in front of my office. Um, but it was really interesting because the more you know about the business of your client, as everyone has just said, the more effective you are at getting the deal, you know, down to the five basic points and you can be it can be so effective for your client to go do other work while you are working on the deal. So we talk about that a lot. Joan? Now I wanted to dig a little bit further into the expertise question that's been sort of batting batted around here. And I like the idea of using outside folks, but whether you're doing oral presentations on contracts or actually contract drafting, the instructor, I assume, in, in your various different courses is working with the students. And personally, I would feel like I was committing teaching or legal malpractice, advising outside of securities regulation, corporate finance, and business associations, which is what I teach. If I were doing, for example, a family law you know, contract, I would feel like I really needed someone in there just for me to advise the student on how to do the presentation or how to do the 
the drafting, and yet I think it's, it's nice to allow the students to do their own thing, something that they're passionate about. So I'm struggling with this expertise question, I think, um, and I've just chosen sort of the narrow hunker down to what I know best path. Um, so I'm looking for help to see if I should be broadening my horizons in some of what I teach. Beyond inviting experts, obviously, into the classroom, for the planning piece of the drafting, you know, and, and the oral presentation. The role of general counsel, frequently, that's why I never became a general counsel of a business. <laughs> any, any given day, you have 100 different things that come across your desk yeah. that you have zero expertise in. Sure. But you're there to advise and provide the, the roadmap where the landmines are, plus, somehow. Plus, you're captive, and they ask you questions that they never would pay an attorney to ask. Uh, I was here if my kid had a DUI. You are free to ask counsel. You are free. You know, one way to get around this, if it does make you feel uneasy, you can set uh, something in a fictional <laughs> jurisdiction just so you don't have to worry that you're infringing some statute that you don't know yeah, about. That's the kind of and universe. you can fulfill all the drafting goals, I think. But again, it lacks that, that realism. Right. Uh, but at least you know you're, you're not wrong. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, name? Mark Osbeth, Michigan. I guess this is a little bit directly at Shelley because you Spoke on using real contacts, contracts. Um, do you ever find that students over rely on them as templates, like when you hand out a sample? Yes. They're like, this is the way it should always be. And just fill in the blank and not think about it. There's always, you know, there's always a handful. Not, it's not a large percentage. We always have three students that just kind of <coughs> do that because either they're lazy or they just don't really feel like it. Um, but then there's students that go so above and beyond that you know that you're kind of making an impact with them. But we talk about use of precedent, and precedent is important, and you don't want to always recreate the wheel. But I do have two or three drafting assignments where they have to kind of, like, where there's no way there's precedent for it. You know, it's um, mostly from my experience in house where there was, they're like, what do you want me to draft? But I give those, you know, those fact patterns, and they have to really think about it. And by the end of the class, you do have to use sort of, you have to look at a big agreement and see what's in there, and you have to look at some of the smaller agreements we've used. I do only use agreements for me. I use agreements that we've used in the clinic that I've actually either drafted, redrafted, revised prior to using them in my class, so I'm pretty comfortable with them. Some of them are a little strange. We have some strange clients. But um, yeah, I think there's always going to be students who don't give you 100%. You know, it's, it's interesting because I actually ask students questions if they, if they use a, uh, a, a contract like that. For example, there's an atonement uh, provision in here. What does that mean? You know, it's, do you understand the provisions you're putting in the contract? I mean, if they're complex and they can't explain it, you can't explain it, don't leave it in there. Yeah, we, we develop what I call clinic commandments, so that I've just said this to somebody here, but by the end of the semester we have these clinic commandments, but one of them that comes out early on is uh, don't include it in the contract unless you can explain not only what it means, but as important, because the students will come in and say, well, that, I know what that means, that a tournament is this, and right. then you say, why does it belong in this deal? Exactly. And if it doesn't belong in this deal, strike it. Mm -hmm. Just because it was in the precedent doesn't mean it applies yeah, to the Yeah, and if you can't explain it when they're negotiating to the opposite you know, opposing counsel, you're going to be embarrassed at some point in your career where you just sort of look stupid, right? I think the other thing that's important that happens in the clinic and drafting, I don't know what your experience with this is uh, as well, but there isn't an attorney that, that you always can improve and massage a document. I mean, there might be something that's been used that was used in my law firm 150 mm -hmm. times before. I still might, with a fresh pair of eyes, see something that somebody else didn't see. Absolutely. And you have to make the students know that you're comfortable with them telling you, hey, what about this? I mean, from engagement letters on, I still, this many 14 years into practice and 18 years into practice, I guess, and four years into this class, have a student find something that no one else has seen in a document, and I want to tell them. That's just that's like right, practice. Right. You, can, you can make a change and make a suggestion. I often look at agreements that I did four, you know, four or five years ago, and I'm like, oh, do this, you know, <laughs> I would do that differently yeah. right now. But we also do a, um, similar kinds of assignments where we have each student draft a specific provision, and then I compile them all anonymously. And they're all different. They're all some of them, you know, might be more effective than others. They all might be effective, but they're all different. And that's contract drafting. Yeah. Will everybody have any questions or? I have one. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. This is about the clinical 
transactional practice. Did uh, Loyola Chicago have any parameters or? Public income requirements and things like that? Yeah, I mean, well, with respect to the size of the metropolitan area, the. You know, All the who would they, Yeah, who, would, who did they expect would use the clinic? You know, there's a couple clinics. Northwestern has an excellent clinic, and they do more um, like the high end, fancy technology clients that we wish we had. And then our clinic is 65% not for profit and it's 35% for profit, but there were not parameters. It was set up 10 years ago by Joe Stone, who's the director of the clinic, and we don't have income parameters and we don't have like really anything. We can take, we take everything, <laughs> but we could, we could be more selective and probably should be. We have 140 <laughs> clients and a wait list of about 60. Um, and it really runs the gamut of maybe excellent teaching and some are just okay, uh, but we don't. And it's something we've thought about looking at and probably haven't gotten it yet. Northwestern is more selective, but now again, I don't think they have specific parameters. Is it all free? It's free to the not-for-profits. It's incredibly minimal to for-profits. I think we caught a uh, charge, I think it's like $100 to incorporate and then maybe $75 per agreement that we do, whether it's an employment agreement or an employee handbook. Um, the reporting fees. studio, yeah, they have to pay their own filing fees. The not for profits do as well, and they pay their um, 501c3 form 1023 fees. Or they don't, or we just fill it out and they don't pay it because they don't have that. So we're on the clinic, I'll ask a follow up question on that too, which is uh, do you have prerequisites for your business clinic, and if so, what are they? We have written prerequisites, we don't always enforce them which is interesting. I'm fairly new at the clinic, but it used to be like business org, tax, um, corporations. We have a lot of people who are getting their tax certificate who take the clinic, they want to be in trans the transactional world, we have some who do, do not. And we typically take third year students only, we've made a few exceptions in, in that realm, and I think actually second semester we should take some year students, because I think the interest level wanes a little bit by the end of third year, and we end up with a lot of unfinished stuff in the summer. How do you fund your clinic? How do we fund it? Mm -hmm. um, no. No, I think it's funded by, there's a very generous donor that's given funds. And then I think this will fix up for us. Uh, and I think we discussed this the other night, that uh, my, my take on it right now until I'm corrected and shown otherwise is as long as the entity doesn't have any income, we'll do work for them. When they get to the point where they are going to get income, then they need to seek outside representation. And I think it's more of a balance so that there's no uh, concern from the outside bar uh, that we're in competition with them. We generate an informational bill because learning oh, to bill is part of the process. A, that's a really good idea. And then we send the informational bill and we say, of course, in the engagement letter, we told you that our services were free. Good right. Here's what this might have cost had you used outside counsel. Feel that. free to make a donation. donation. <laughs> I thought about like, that little donate hour, that kind yeah, of thing, sending that, that out. Because some of our clients are happy. I mean, intermiss. I mean, they pay their own. They right. pay all the filing fees and all that. Mm -hmm. But we struggle with that as a lead clients that start from nothing and then they become sort of viable clients so and they, then they get it. Like, ooh, I'm getting some really good legal mm -hmm. service and you have institutional knowledge and you're great because I can just call you. And we're in that situation now where we're having to sort of cut the cord on a couple of clients that have outgrown us, frankly. And you know, I can even argue to the private bar that we're educating these people to know, to understand what they don't know. I love that. And, and not only that, but we're probably going to give them students that can bring in business, you know, upon starting work. So I think there is a benefit. Yeah, I think you can sell it different ways. Yeah, plus we only have like five clients that are not paid for one. <laughs> Our business clients who don't pay a fee as flaky as other clients who don't pay a fee who are not like being dragged into court on a criminal matter. In other words, you have people that just don't like show up for meetings or they get really oh, yeah. far behind. Yeah, okay. I had someone actually cancel a meeting because they forgot they were getting married. That was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> That's my best one so far. Yes, absolutely. They act exactly as other clients behave. It's shocking. Um, it's it's interesting. Just like any anything, if you give it away for free, either people don't appreciate it or they use it too much. I, I have one client that if he's doing business 
with someone. Would you look them up in Martindale Hubble? I mean, uh, he wants me to do his personal research for them, or he wants a, a clinic to do personal research for him. And I had to kind of say, you know, we will do documents for you, we will produce things for you, but we can't be your sounding board for your decision making, you know? So. And difficult clients can be great for the students, like Absolutely. the really crazy, mean clients. Like, that freaks the student out, like, you cannot even believe. But it's a really good learning experience, because not all your clients are going to be warm, fuzzy, thank you so much kind of clients, you know? So, yeah, but I, they go silent and kind of start turning red. <laughs> Well, I know that I've benefited a lot from the people in this room and from others that I've, I've, uh, I've interacted with in other programs. So if there's anything I can do to help you, please let me know. Okay? Thank you.